Welcome to Halting Towards Zion, the podcast where we limp like Jacob to the promised land and talk about life, the universe, and everything along the way. I'm Emily Maxson, here with Greg Ettinger and Rachel Wojtek. And we are, well, last week we talked about the founding of Rome. I say last week, last time. I don't know when you're listening to this. I also don't know when we're releasing this, because <laughs> I don't do that anymore. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, speaking of, actually, I'm going to interrupt myself and say thank you so much to everyone who has reached out to us to tell us that you are listening to the podcast and enjoying it. Um, it's We can't tell you how encouraging it is to hear from you and to hear that what we're doing here is a blessing to you. Um, thank you for bearing with us through weird scheduling things. Uh, I regret to inform you that weird scheduling things will continue to occur. <laughs> um, we are... Doing our best to accommodate the three different schedules of the three of us. Um, and as you know, if you've been listening for a while, uh, there are babies coming. <laughs> and so we're not sure what the next few months are going to look like. But thank you so much for your encouragement and for sticking with us. Um, and today we will continue our narrative through ancient Rome. Um, I think we left off with Romulus and Remus. Is that right? Well, more or less, we, we, we kind of skipped ahead and I'm just going to do that again. Okay. Um, <laughs> Sounds good. From, from Rome, uh, Romulus on, there are 10 kings, more or less historical. Um, and Rome wasn't picky about where a particular king came from. So some were Etruscan or of some other nearby ethnic variety, as long as they were the kind of guy they were looking for. <laughs> It's more of an ethos. Yeah. They, they, they ended up, though, with, with some guys on the throne they didn't like and finally said, well, you know, the part of the problem here is the whole political system. Let's change that and that'll fix everything. And so the kingdom gave way to the Republic. Republic is from two Latin words, race publica, which means the things public. Traditionally, the things that make a Republic a Republic are representative government and written laws. The written laws came later. Um, we'll get to that in a second. Uh, mostly so, it was it was representation by people who were elected somehow, directly or indirectly, by the older males of the existing tribes that already made up Rome. In times, the kings um, splintered those tribes into other tribes, as governments are wont to do. Um, you may remember that Solomon turned Israel into 12 federal districts, which did not correspond to the tribes, because when you got a federal government versus state governments, oddly enough, there's this kind of tug and pull back and forth. <laughs> and sometimes you want to um, downplay state boundaries. Anyway, so that's something with a history as, as long as Rome. The thing that really, that you're going to run into in any discussion of Roman history is its class system. So we should mm -hmm. say a few things about that. Uh, the First of all, there were three classes. No, there were two. No, there were three. <laughs> there were patricians, plebeians, and slaves. Uh, it, it is amazing how the slaves get regularly overlooked, as they do when you talk about ancient Greece, but they were a large percentage of the population and a decided factor in everything that happened. They just get like zero play in the history books. Because we want to respect Romans, we want to respect Greece, because they're the alternatives to actually turning around and looking at what God was doing with Israel and telling them how they should live. We didn't want that, so let's just kind of recreate Greece and then Rome in our image, how we would have done it, how we imagine them. So forget slaves. Obviously, they're not important. What becomes important then in the standard books are the other two classes. Patrician, the uh, Latin word pater means father. So these were the uh, the, the fathers of the tribes, the, the the people that were looked up to, the the older, better educated, more sophisticated, more the land, more property. Yeah, the bigwigs. The others were the plebeians. Now the word plebeian or pleb still shows up today in the military academies. First year students mm -hmm. are called plebs. And are treated horribly because why not? <laughs> um, the Romans, at least as far as their patrician historians are willing to tell us, the patricians treated the plebeians okay-ish. 
um, a patrician would sort of adopt a plebeian family and look after his interests and encourage him and maybe loan him some money on high interest. And, and the, the plebeian should return to the patrician and, and have his back and help him in any way he could and borrow money from him at interest. Um, and so these two groups sort of got along most of the time. But once the Republic becomes a thing, the plebeians begin to realize that they have the possibility to have a say in things. Uh, we should do. note that the ple the plebeians are the more artisan class, the people who yeah, are doing yeah. the work in the city. Right. Yeah, the people who actually do stuff. <laughs> yeah. uh, Which doesn't necessarily mean, uh, often the word is associated with more like just low serfs or peasantry or something you know, like that. And it's not, that's that's actually more of what the slaves were. Right, right. Uh, so, it, yeah, sometimes that connotation's lost. Uh, it, in fact, what the, the plebeians, the kind of services they rendered were so important that on a couple of occasions, when the plebeians pushed for political reforms that would give them more freedom and more protection under the law, and the patricians weren't inclined to go along, the plebeians just walked out of the city. They went up on the hillside and just watched Rome for a while. <laughs> uh, and realizing that if we're not there to fix your, your horseshoes and sell you wine and uh, build your, your, your carts, flip your burgers, yeah, you're, 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 you're going to be kind of stuck real fast. And they were. And every time the plebeians tried this, it, it worked. The patricians would eventually say, okay, come on back. We'll give you kind of what you want. They're a little negotiating. But largely the plebeians were able to push things forward. And after a sort of semi-Republican, semi-Democratic approach to, you know, well, if you're not going to be what I want, I'm going to take my ball and go home or actually leave home. Um, and, and so those who study such things, this, this is an interesting um, thing to look at. The main thing probably that, that we should at least note in passing is that one thing the plebeians wanted were written secular laws. I mentioned earlier that normally we think of a republic as something that has written laws. Well, Rome had them, except they were interpreted by the priests, and the priests were the ones who could read them and have copies of them, and ordinary people didn't. So when the plebeian went to the priest to get a law interpreted to see if it could help him, somehow it always didn't. The priests always seemed to side with the patricians rather than the plebeians. or The person or, who could give them money. Yeah, um, <laughs> that. So, uh, what they, what the plebeians wanted was one written that is written in the sense that it was in words they could understand and have access to, and secular in the sense that they would not be interpreted by the priest. Anybody could read them. This, this is a huge step forward in a lot of ways, and we looked a little bit last time at the um, the so-called Twelve Tables, which are with the written laws, they were set up in the in the marketplace in the forum, where everybody could have access to. So this this is a good thing, and we've seen before that God's common grace is displayed early on in Rome in a number of productive ways, um, but it doesn't last very long. But it's a thing, and we should note wherever God is good to a people, it's worth saying. Yeah, he did something good, and our founding fathers would look at that and say, written laws, what a concept. <laughs> of course, the Bible already was that, but, you know, <laughs> and it's, it's more than possible that the idea came from Moses, but we don't know for sure. We don't know what the, the, the channels of common grace were that uh, made Rome initially a city concerned about ethics and morality and, and, and how exactly their laws reflected some of the language of the case laws in Exodus 21 and 22. Interesting study for future historians. Well, what happens, at, so once that's on its way, what begins to happen is that Rome, now being a significant presence on the Italian peninsula, begins to come into contact with other cities there that are not Roman. There's sometimes some ethnic relationships, because, you know, everybody goes everywhere and intermarries with everybody, and the languages are not all that different. And they're all Japhetic in any case, descended from Japheth. Um, and I, I, it's not my intention or desire to talk through all of Rome's Italian campaigns. There were a number, and the thing that it will be it will be said at the end of all of this that Rome lost battles but never lost a war. And this is largely true. Sometimes she lost a lot of battles. Sometimes she came really close to losing wars. But she just kept slogging until eventually something cracked. One of the 
what, as we look at um, her her wars on the peninsula and then afterwards her wars abroad, one of the things, or maybe the thing, uh, besides her dedicated soldier uh, farmer army, that really gave her an edge was her incredible ability to write peace treaties. Um, she, Rome was able to look at every conquered city and say, what do you want? What are we willing to give you? How can we make this work? And we're not, besides the vague idea of looking, well, we have tried something like that before. We're not doing uh, cookie cutter treaties with anybody. Uh, you people, you're going to be our slaves. You people, we're giving you full citizenship. You people, you have citizenship, but you can't vote. But you do need to give us money in armies. Um, you people can go on doing what you were doing, but um, mutual self-defense things going on. And in each case, Rome had the political genius to see what would work, what the what that conquered people would accept and live with that would still leave Rome in the driver's seat. And she did this for the next 300 or so, 400 years. That's pretty impressive. Uh, if only our State Department could come up with that kind of wisdom. Um, and, and so that's what we begin to see, uh, even as Rome faces city after city on the Italian peninsula, and in turn um, defeats each of them. There's the, I'm just going to look at titles here, the first Samnite War, the second or Great Samnite War, the uh, the third Samnite War, whoa, the battle with um, Tarentum, the uh, there's I think there's another one, the Capuan War, I believe. I don't know. And if you are a historian, these mean something too. If you're a military historian, these mean something. They're beyond the scope of what we want to do. None of us is a military historian. Not to say this isn't interesting. It's just not the thing that we've been we've been focusing on. Um, so, uh, with your per permission, ladies, I'm just kind of. Sounds good. Okay, <laughs> moving on. <laughs> Rome is now in control of uh, all of Italy south of the Po Valley, which which is, is is a lot. And and she has not yet lost a battle, although some of these things were were difficult. It's at this point that she gets involved with Sicily. Sicily's have is being messed with by. Um, or actually, it's Masana in Sicily. It's being messed with by her neighbor, Syracuse. So these are mm -hmm. kingdoms just off the boot and out on the yeah, island. Sicily's the the bigger island off the toe of the boot, isn't it? Right. South of the toe. Yes. Yeah, the, the soccer ball. Yeah. I, did find, <laughs> I will say as a side note, I did find pulling up a map of the expansion of the Roman Empire to be very helpful when you're going to try to go through all of these wars oh, and back yeah. and forth. Because I kept going, where... Who? What is this name? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know Italian geography and that well no. enough. So, if you want to go through all these things, pull up a map, which I always yeah. recommend, by the way. But well, in broad <laughs> in broad terms, and we probably should have said this at some point. Well, yes, get a map. Those <laughs> an antiquated ancient devices whereby people used to find their ways from one place to another before the voice out of thin air would tell you. <laughs> Stop at the next stop sign and turn right. Um, it's amazing how many students do not know how to use a road map and how many students, well, not just students, don't know how to use a map at all or knowing how to use a map don't. I was just looking up some um, a maps for my wife. There's a, there's a website, and I don't remember what it's called, that has a whole lot of maps of the United States that show you all kinds of weird statistics, <laughs> like which cities have... Um, Oh, it's not just the United States, the United States and the world, for instance, with the world. How many countries drive on the left-hand side of the road? Uh, how many countries has England not invaded? It's amazing, <laughs> how, it's amazing how few. Um, uh, when some rubber ducks fell off a boat in the middle of the Pacific, which direction did the currents carry them? <laughs> Most of them, oddly enough, went up into the Bering Straits around the Arctic Sea and ended up in New York and um, the great United Kingdom. What? <laughs> Some ended up in Australia. Um, yeah, it's th these these kind of things, and I forget what I was going here. Oh, yes. And uh, attached to this, uh, not part of that site, but something you could click on 
to visit was um, maps of the United States that Brits were invited to fill out. Oh, dear. In other words, <laughs> yeah. In other words, here are the shapes of the states. What, do you know their names? And if so, which name goes with which blank here on this map? It was pretty bad. It is like, always surprising, like when you hear <laughs> British people talking about visiting the United States yeah. because oh. they have no sense of the scale yeah. of the United States. I want to go to States. Coney Island this is a in Disneyland. Huge country. <laughs> they, they um, so even yeah. as we're talking about the expansion of the Roman Empire, Italy was a lot to govern. Yeah. So when we thought when we talk about how insane it is that the United States is governing basically coast to coast this continent, yeah. um, you know, the the parts that are temperate in climate, shall we say. <laughs> there's, there's the cold north and the hot south. And we, we just live in the sweet spot here. But it's an insane project historically. Yeah, yeah it, it really is. The other thing then is that in revenge, Americans were giving them, given a map of Europe. <laughs> oh, dear. Oh, no. <laughs> I will, yeah, I will add my one other map. Thing of every time I taught my Middle East studies class, I would first ask the students to list the countries that are in the Middle East. Oh, wow. <laughs> I think the most they could get was five mm -hmm. out of the 16 I was looking for, and the majority would forget Israel. <laughs> <laughs> and then when I gave them the 16 and a map, I think the highest score of labeling, well, if they had never been in the class before, it was three or four out of 16. Yeah. You know. mm. It was just, but but Europe is no better when you try to start talking yeah. about you know where who's going where and yeah, constant maps are needed. Yes. Usually, I turn this to like give the Americans some credit where most of us can actually put most of the states in place. Yeah, and that's like the size of Europe. So like yeah. when people say Americans aren't well traveled and they don't know geography, well, we are well traveled, <laughs> just. In this country. In our, in our it's own just country. weird that Which our country is, is so big. Uh, yeah, yeah. Mm, Although so I would cool. say Californians travel a bit less because we can travel far and stay in California. <laughs> oh, I yeah. I feel like those on yeah. the East Coast or even the Midwest have a bit more sense of where more states Other are than states. we do on yeah, the West. Yeah, because they travel through three or four of them in the time it takes us to get to L.A. Yeah. <laughs> so there's, I've, I've experienced that with my my friends at college. Um, all of that, I don't remember even where this was all going. We were saying look oh, at looking maps. At, yeah. looking when at you me, start talking about all the wars that they're going to fight yeah. and where, who, oh, which yeah, city yeah, yeah, they're yeah. De dealing with. Yeah. yeah. If you want to understand what's going on, look up maps. They're look all over maps. the internet. That that would help. Yeah. Google any, it. <laughs> any, so we were Sicily and Syracuse. Mm -hmm. uh, and after some initial swapping of sites, what it comes down to is that Rome and Carthage both have an interest in Sicily and so begin to fight. Now, Carthage is across the Mediterranean in North Africa. It's a Phoenician colony. We've talked about it. Not in terms, in Tunis. Yes. Um, in other words, Tatuni, right? Um Luke Skywalker, all that. Tatooine? Uh, yeah. Did I say it wrong? Is that I'm where sorry. they filmed it? Yeah, I think so. Oh. Wow. Yeah, if I'm if I'm wrong, I'm wrong. It's somewhere <laughs> it's somewhere very close to there in any case. Um yeah. So we we we've seen the story of the Aeneid and that Rome's historical conflict goes back to when Aeneas made love to Dido. And then dropped her cold at the word of the gods and left her, and she killed herself. So obviously, these two cities can never get along. <laughs> <sighs> Destiny. Destiny, yes. Oh, something else in passing I completely forgot to mention before. There is a blood relationship between Dido, Queen of Carthage, and Jezebel. Oh, no, we talked about that. Did we talk about that? Yeah, when okay. we talked about Jezebel or in the oh, okay, so Phoenicians. All right. Yeah, All right. we did. And mention. Dropping that. But it does give some <laughs> sense of uh, proximity in time. All right. So these two powers are now displeased with each other. Advantages. Um, Carthage has a really great navy. Rome has a really great army. As long as you're on some fixed standing place, Rome is going to win because its army is so cool. But when it comes to trying to pilot a ship across the Mediterranean, Rome doesn't know the first thing about ships. In fact, she barely has any until she actually 
captures a Phoenician ship and tries to copy it. So this is Rome's attempt to actually create a ship, but she still doesn't have any real clue about strategy and tactics on the ocean. So Rome's solution is a boarding plank, which is to say, we're going to pull our ship up alongside a Phoenician ship. We're going to drop this long plank that has spiky things in the end. It's going to fall into their deck and stick and create a bridge. And then we're going to send all our soldiers, our Marines over, and <laughs> we're going to go hand to hand with swords and we're going to win because we have really cool soldiers. It works usually. Um, although in the process of perfecting this, Rome lost fleet after fleet after fleet because her admirals had no clue what they were doing. And they finally got down to one. We have enough money for one more fleet. Please make this work. And and it did. And they were able to um, defeat Carthage. Rome annexed Sicily. And so Rome had her first overseas province, although overseas was, you know, like a stone's throw from the tip of the Italian boot to um the soccer ball off her coast. Um, and then for a time, things settle down. But the bad blood's there. They both hate each other's guts. And of course, beyond this is the, is the question of political and economic rivalry on the Mediterranean. At this point, Phoenician ships went all over the place, inside the Mediterranean and outside. Mm -hmm. um, this is still in the wake of, of Solomon and uh, all of that. And ships are going places we know not whither because the, the merchant princes of Phoenicia were under very solemn oath never to tell anybody where they were going, what was there, how to get there, or how to get back. Very valuable there, trade secret. Yeah, yeah. There's a story of one Phoenician prince who set sail beyond the Pillars of Heracles out uh, past the Gibraltar, of Gibraltar. Yeah. states of Gibraltar, and saw that he was being followed by a ship of another nation. He tried to shake it and couldn't, and so he took his ship to the coast of Gaul, France, and wrecked it. <laughs> and then he and his men made their way home by foot. Because where he was going was Britain and British tin mines, and mm -hmm. they nobody got to know about that. And so the prince went home, told what he had done, and all of his prince friends bought him a new ship in thanks for keeping the trade secrets. Um, this is not to say that no one else wondered out there. And in this context, the three books written by Barry Feld while he was still alive are valuable, although you need to read carefully. Barry Feld was a, um, I believe, a marine biologist at Harvard. But his hobby was pursuing ancient inscriptions um, on both sides of the Atlantic. And his books argue not only that the Phoenicians made it past the Straits of Gibraltar and as far as everywhere, uh, including the New World, but that the Romans seem to have done so as well. And evidence is in the form of inscriptions and uh, artifacts and coins and things that it's amazing how many people lost foreign coin collections in farmers' fields only to be discovered years later. And somehow they all dated from ancient Judea, ancient Rome, ancient, you name it. Oh yeah, that's just somebody's coin collection. Or <laughs> people who use the coins actually were here once upon a time. Anyway, um, America BC is his most famous book. And I recommend it to you, though understanding that there are, it does have some limitations and certainly has been challenged. But the whole thing of did Columbus really discover America has been a challenge ever since um, someone said, well, there's this guy named Leif Erikson. Yeah. Um, it's pr pretty, pretty undisputed that Leif Erikson was there first. Yeah. But, yeah. you know, he didn't get as far as the United States. So <laughs> it doesn't really count. Of course, he did it at Columbus as far as that goes. Um, and, and, and so something that may be going on here is that they were fighting for control of not only trade in the Mediterranean, and will this, the Mediterranean, be a Carthaginian lake or a Roman lake, but also with trade beyond. Uh, at this point, Rome seems to be able to acquire a lot of lumber, and this may have come from, and gold, and these may both have come from the New World, uh, or, or Carthage may have been picking up, I forget, I forget Barry Fell's exact order. In fact, let me read my footnote and see if I can... <laughs> see what it says. I thought I could. Uh, Dr. Fell argues that the timber to build the Carthaginian fleet, I'm sorry, I got it backwards, and gold to pay our mercenaries, soldiers had both come from the Americas. And so when Carthage fell, well, it's a goodbye to America. 
Anyway, be that as it may, um, eventually these two powers decide they need to go to war again. And a gentleman named Hannibal <laughs> from Carthage decides that rather than take a fleet directly across, and, and of course they have they have fleets. Um, they're, they're, they are, by this point, they're also moving into Spain, which they were allowed to do under treaty as long as that you can go this far with weapons, but no further. And they had, they honored the treaty to a time, but they wanted, they were restless and they wanted to go further. And Hannibal finally says, what if I just take, you know, elephants? And Rachel, you had some, <laughs> something to say, I think about elephants and Hannibal and such. So, Well, part of it is it's very unusual. So it sticks in your mind, but, um, <laughs> I did look up a little bit of why in the world would he choose elephants uh, of all things, especially because his plan is to cross the Alps <laughs> in the midst of snow, ice, all of that blizzarding weather. That's um, not but the situation where elephants are happiest, is it? <laughs> no, no, that's not where I would put elephants. Uh, but uh, a lot of it was they were a symbol of power in North mm -hmm. Africa. And mm -hmm. most likely they think the particular kind of elephant he used was actually a species that we don't have anymore that came from the Atlas Mountains in uh, North Africa. So mm. they were particularly associated with their culture and army. Also, elephants are extremely intimidating and unexpected when if you can actually get them over the mountain. Uh, <laughs> and so they do play a certain... Um, psychological part in their warfare once they actually can get over. But unfortunately they do, they did lose a lot of them a lot, along with a lot of their men as they went across the mountains, because um, not only did they have all the weather of the Alps to deal with and basic issues like falling off cliffs, uh, freezing to death, uh, but also the tribes that lived in those areas didn't like them and so <laughs> would purposefully uh, harass and attack and kill them. Although they did work with local people for guides and things like that, but the overall... Would these be Teutonic peoples? They'd be Celtic. Uh, Celtic? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Celtic. The Cisalpine um, Gauls. Yeah. So it's, yeah, it's just a really interesting um, moment in history where he, yeah, Hannibal does something very unexpected which helps but the unexpected also means it's there's a reason people don't expect Not you to convenient. do it this way <laughs> <laughs> yeah there's going to be a lot of trouble it's like would you would you like to sacrifice almost 50 percent of your men and lots of your uh transportation so you can get to the other side he counted the cost and said it was worth it and he does yeah. he, he is really successful when he gets to the other side and we still uh, remember it today yeah. like Th there is that. The, <laughs> yeah. As we were looking at the Alps when we were in Switzerland earlier this year, we were like, huh, it makes sense that Hannibal was remembered for getting elephants <laughs> over those things. Because that, you know, we, we've heard it so many times. Hannibal took elephants over the Alps. Hannibal took elephants over the Alps. And then you see the Alps and you're like, how did he get <laughs> elephants over the Alps? <laughs> With no. great difficulty. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Anyway, having gotten the the elephants over the Alps, which is now becoming a chant, apparently, um, he was able to ravage the Italian peninsula going up and down with his elephants. And everybody said, wow, those are elephants. We can't possibly stand up against them. Let's go hide in our cities. <laughs> we are like grasshoppers in their sight. Yeah. And, yes. and, and that kind of... So Hannibal really... He, the, the elephants did not make great battering rams, apparently. And so once everyone was locked up in their city, in theory, you were beseeching a whole bunch of cities, but not really because you are limited. And so you're, you're constantly chasing people back into their cities. And anytime you go away, they come out and then you go back and chase them some more. It was not an ideal situation for Roman or allies at all, but it wasn't great for Hannibal because he wanted people to come out and fight him so he could elephants could step on them. <laughs> so there was that. There was one, and this is just a passing thing because the name means something. There was a Roman general named Fabius Maximus who would follow, when, when Hannibal left with his elephants, he would follow and harass his flanks. Mm -hmm. And then Hannibal would turn around and go after him and he'd run away. Which, of course, it seems an unmanly and unRoman sort of thing to do, but it was effective. really, really, uh, it, yeah, it was really annoying and effective <laughs> on one level. And thus, the idea of slowly wearing people down became associated with the name Fabius. 
And so, um, what, like 1,500 years later or so, this little society in England will call itself the Fabian Society because they don't want to impose socialism through violent war. They just want to slowly wear everybody down by writing cool things for the London Times. <laughs> uh, and so Fabian socialism, slow creeping socialism, this is where it gets its name, for whatever little that's worth. <laughs> Chesterton uh, dealt a lot with the Fabians, didn't he? Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. Same time. Same time, interactions and all that. Mm -hmm. um, eventually, um, a, a man arises from Rome. His name is either Scipio or Scipio, depending on how you want to pronounce the, the SC. Um and he uh, goes before the Roman Senate and says, look, we got to do something about this guy. Give me some, some room here. Um, and having arranged for Hannibal's uh, brother to be dispatched, um, and Hannibal found out when his brother's head was thrown into his camp, uh, Scipio then decides the, the obvious thing is to go for the jugular. Forget fighting elephants. Let me take the battle to Carthage. And the Senate is not keen on this, but they have no better idea. So Scipio is able to gather the ships and an army and go to Carthage, at which point Carthage screams to Hannibal, help, the Romans are coming, get back here. So he has to leave and then do whatever he has done. And the two generals meet at a battlefield called Zama in North Africa, and Scipio wins. What we're rarely told is that Hannibal ran away <laughs> and he ran east. And he's later going to end up in the court of one of the Seleucid kings, one of the Antiochuses. Um, and he's not gone. He's not out of the picture. He's going to cause trouble for Rome later. But in, as far as defending Carthage, uh, that it's over. So that ends that war. Carthage is thoroughly smacked down and has handed a peace treaty that says, well, we're going to let you survive and trade with some restraints and you may never rearm yourself ever, ever again. Sounds like some of the treaties the United States has imposed on people. Um, and, and, and so that's the end of the second war. And if at this point, if uh, Carthage was in contact with the new world and getting supplies there, that dies and whatever, contact the ancient world may have had with the Americas, gone. There's still a third war because there are still old guys in Rome that fear Carthage and figure if we don't kill it, if we don't stamp it into the ground, if we don't uh, eliminate it thoroughly, it's going to come back because it always does. And most people, well, I don't know most people, anybody who's studied history has run into Cato the Elder who was a Roman senator and made many speeches about many things, but every time he ended any speech about anything, didn't matter what it was, he ended with the words in Latin, Carthago de Linda Est, which is Carthage must be destroyed. And so we should raise these taxes and Carthage must be destroyed. We should build a new wall for Rome and Carthage must be destroyed. We should uh, improve the harbor uh, where the Tiber, uh, where Rome sits in the Tiber and Carthage must be, it just constantly, it just kept it in front of people. In itself, it didn't, it didn't do anything, but it, it just kept reminding people, yeah, they're the bad guys, aren't they? It's kind of like, when I grew up, this, <laughs> when I grew up, we, as a child, watched TV far more than I should have. Primetime TV consisted of doctor shows, police lawyer shows, and World War II shows. A lot of World War II shows. Which is to say, I grew up believing that the Germans and the Japanese were our enemies, because in every TV show, they were. Mm. And I remember once playing war with a neighbor kid, and we were debating who would be the American and who would be the German bad guy. Mm. And my dad, my dad stepped in and said, who was very sensitive to propaganda, would say, we're not, the Germans are not the bad guys, we're not fighting the, 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 the Germans. Who are we fighting? The North Vietnamese. The who? <laughs> it shows how much we watched the news or paid attention to anything real. We knew Germans. We knew Japanese. We didn't know Vietnamese. This is why when people we knew were being drafted to go serve in Vietnam, we were oblivious at, you know, the age of seven, eight, nine. Um, 
propaganda matters. Who you keep pointing figures at matters. Uh, give it enough time. It's a seed bed. It may not in and of itself produce the war you're looking for, but it sure enough helps when the time comes. And in this case, Carthage eventually gets attacked by um, some uh, the Numidians from um, further down in Africa. And, you know, when a nation uh, attacks you, you think maybe you should pull out your swords and respond, at least to defend yourself. But they weren't supposed to use weapons or have an army or anything. But they figured, well, the alternative is we can either try to talk Rome down off of this later and fight and save ourselves now, or we can just throw up our hands and all be killed or run away and whatever. So they do fight, and Rome steps in and says, ah, we told you not to do that. And so Rome lands an army in Africa, attacks Carthage, destroys it, plows it up, sows it with salt, and lays a curse upon it. The end. You would think <laughs> until later Rome will come back, and I believe it was Julius Caesar, and rebuild the city. <sighs> it's like the Babylonians or the um, Assyrians rebuilding Babylon. <laughs> because, well, some, there needs to be something there. It's such um, a good place to have a city. <laughs> yeah. Things, <laughs> things that make this significant. Now, first of all, the Carthaginians were, were Phoenicians. And by the way, Phoenicians, Punic. Greeks invented the name Phoenicia for the Canaanites. And Rome did them the favor of mispronouncing their, their invention. So Punic, Phoenician, Canaanite. It's an obvious connection, right? <laughs> um, Noah, in his prophecy after the flood, had said that Canaan, his, the, the son of Ham, his descendants, would be servants of servants unto both the children of Shem and the children of Japheth. The Canaanites who stayed in Canaan uh, were either exterminated or didn't stay. They were driven out. Or in some rare cases became temple servants. You can think of the Gibeonites, the Gibeonites here. Gibeonites, yeah. Yeah, servants of servants, the best of servants. So here was something, a prophecy that was deliberately ambiguous. You're going to be servants, but you can be the coolest servants that there ever were, and some took that, or you can be slaves and, and worse. And it will be true both in Israel, but it will also be true in the larger Japhetic world. And so we have here the sons of Japheth, Rome and her allies, and Carthage, descended from Canaan, fighting out this last battle and Noah's prophecies fulfilled. The other thing, and, and G.K. Chesterton, and he's not alone, makes a big deal about this. Being Canaanites, the Carthaginians were Baal worshippers. Uh, more specifically, they worshipped Baal under the name Moloch. And Moloch... Renowned for child sacrifice, Moloch? That one. Well. Interest, interesting thing there. It is amazing how many archaeologists and historians in recent decades, if not years, have insisted that that was all uh, propaganda, that no one would ever do that, and that the archaeological finds of lots of dead babies, you know, those are probably babies who died in plague or something, because nobody would actually do that. That was just enemy propaganda. I mean, the only real evidence we have is the Bible says that's what the what Moloch worshippers did, but you know how reliable is the Bible as a historical source. Um <laughs> Well, it's uh, ignoring that our own generation uh, has, yeah. in a sense, sacrificed yeah. millions of our own babies. So clearly, mm -hmm. we're capable. It's not that far fetched. <laughs> and gen yeah, cultures around the world have always had certain undesirable babies that they've been willing to oh, leave yes. out to the elements and other things. It is amazing not to how quickly humans could not possibly commit such atrocities. Um, goes along with historical revisionism. <laughs> like it's it's as soon as you draw a line of what you're willing to believe human beings yeah. will not do, yeah. you're you're in really dicey territory. <laughs> yep. Um uh, this this is a complete side issue, but I'm I'm gonna mention anyway just because um Isaac Asimov wrote a short story, I believe it was Asimov, um about a man who is obsessed with this idea that um, the, 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 the Carthaginians didn't really kill their babies. And if only, and he sets about trying to create a time viewer 
um, so that will allow them to see into the past to to exonerate this ancient honorable culture. Um, and he keeps running into government roadblock after government roadblock. No one will give him the financing, the licenses, the permitting, everything. Everything is a no, 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 no. Finally, he says, look, I can do it. I know I can do it. It will tell me what I need to know. And the final word is, no, you can't. But then I think he, the government officials reveal either to us, the readers, or possibly to him, the real reason. We do not want you to see the past. But here's the real reason. The past ended one second ago. Hmm. If you can view the past, you can look into the private lives of every person on the planet without them knowing. We don't want to give that to anybody. <laughs> so something to think about there. I wish I could remember the name of the short story. I've read it a few times. Um, but moving on. Um, so now Carthage is down. Rome has no other huge challenge in the Mediterranean and is, is now a sea power. Uh, Moloch worship has gone down the tubes, Baal worship, God has, oh yes, God has finished Baal worship. And back to Chesterton. <laughs> Chesterton looks at this in, uh, a ch uh, it's one of the chapters in uh, The Everlasting Man. Uh, and he says, and we should be glad of this, because Moloch was a horrible demon, a horrible god. Yes, the Romans worshipped pagan gods, but they were kinder, gentler gods. By this time, they weren't that big a deal. I mean, it's not like the Romans ever practiced human sacrifice or anything. Hmm. Um, so we can sympathize with a, with a simple Roman farmer soldier who, having won his battle, goes home to his his little Roman farm and his little Roman wife and his little Roman gods and kicks back and just enjoys life. We, 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 we have something to share with such a man, and we can thank Rome for saving us from this greater evil. Yes, and deeply no. <laughs> yeah, you know, Romans 13, where Rome is personified as a beast of terrible, horrible proportions that makes war upon the saints and uh, kills Revelation them. 13? Revelation, what did I say? You said Romans. Oh, well, you see, Romans 13 <laughs> says, Romans 13 says, and obey Rome for now. Revelation yep. 13 says, uh, however, it's going to get real hard. Because Rome's going to try to kill you all. Um, the Bible does not have a great deal of respect for Rome. Uh, Rome sometimes, the Roman officials sometimes protected the church in the book of Acts. The main persecutors of the church in the book of Acts is apostate Israel. And all the Herods <laughs> who were Indomian, Indom Edomites, adopted Israelites, but in bed with, with Rome. So they were Roman officials just not Roman by descent. But then who was Roman by descent at that point? <laughs> so you have the Herods, who are sort of the little horn of Rome thrusting itself at the church, while other officials, you know, okay, no, you can't, you can't tear them in pieces on my watch. No, we're not going to have a riot today. Yeah, Paul, um, yeah, we're not going to kill you. We're just going to keep you in prison until you give us a bribe. You know, things like that are going on. There's a, res there's a certain amount of respect for Rome's accomplishments, and it's rather even-handedness in dispensing justice. They didn't care who you were. You got the same treatment because they despised everybody. Um, but the idea that we should sympathize with the Roman demons, which is what their gods were, simply because they weren't demanding child sacrifice at that point. Uh, Chesterton's really reaching for it. But the reason he's reaching for it, as far as I can see, is he goes on to say, and it was that Rome that gave birth to the papacy. <laughs> so what he really doing is a Roman Catholic is saying, Rome's always been the obvious place for the good guys to be. Yeah, um, that's, a, that's a real Gil Roman Catholic convert move, which yeah. Chesterton was. I didn't realize this until I read a biography of his wife mm. a few years ago. Um, yeah, he didn't become a Roman Catholic until later in life, I didn't which know that. whenever you, um, yeah, he didn't become Roman Catholic after not being Roman Catholic, you know, that they're way too enthusiastic <laughs> about everything about Rome. Yeah. Um, 
Yeah. Well, he was he was quite enthusiastic about Rome, and mm-hmm. I think you, you I, I recommend the book The Everlasting Man. Sure. And I even yeah. recommend that chapter, but read it r- just just to see where this kind of thinking can lead if you're not really, really, really careful. <laughs> well, let's let's kind of wrap up with this. What happened? What happens next? There are no more major challenges. The remaining powers that are left are those farther east, and this is the remnants of Alexander's kingdom. So we have Macedonian descendants of, of Alexander, or of his generals, more accurately. We have the Seleucids in Syria and Babylon. We have the Ptolemies in Egypt, um, let's see, Macedonia, oh, and um, Asia Minor. So all of these powers are there. None of them is that big a deal as far as the whole Mediterranean is concerned anymore. This is not a great kingdom. It's a very splintered kingdom. And Rome encounters one of these after another and is annoyed by them. And they're frightened by Rome. And as I said, Hannibal shows up in, in the um, in the background and says, hey, guys, these Romans are really dangerous. You should take them over. Yeah, that didn't work at all. And so Rome is constantly attacking because she's threatened, sometimes by real armies, sometimes just by, you know, hey, he's looking at me. We better go beat him up. <laughs> um, and, and, and by the time we're done, Rome is kind of doing this pincher movement. She has interest in in Egypt that we'll come back to. She's moving down through Greece, Macedonia, Asia Minor towards Syria, and there's Israel still being harassed by the Seleucids, Antiochus, Epiphanes, and and his descendants. And um, and and as they fight to gain their freedom, the Roman armies are just next door. And so there's when we when we get to the New Testament. Hey, how did Rome get in charge? Well, that's the story, I guess, for next time. <laughs> yeah, we do have to stop there for the sake of time, um, and we're even going to skip recommendations this week for the st- sake of time. Um, so we will see you next week with uh, further adventures in ancient Rome. Um, a few things to tell you as we head out. Per usual, we would love to hear from you if you want to send us an email. Helping towards Zion at gmail.com. Uh, one thing I don't often say that I should say more often is that this is a production of Diecast Media Group. Um, remember how I mentioned I don't do the, the release schedule anymore? I don't even know when these episodes go out. That's because we have more people helping us. And so we're thankful to Diecast Media Group for uh, supporting this effort and adding to our labors. There are other shows that we make that we can talk about another time. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, as I said, you can get in touch with us if you would like to uh, tell a friend about us. We'd appreciate that. If you're enjoying the show, chances are someone you know will also. Um, and big thank you to our financial supporters who keep the show rolling. If you'd like to join their ranks, you can visit patreon.com slash halting towards Thank you so much for listening, and we'll see you next time. 